Hi there. I'm Adele Costa, the Director of Communications here at the National Women's Health Network, also known as The Network. For those of you who are new to us, we're a DC-based nonprofit that works to improve health by strategically shaping policy, expanding healthcare access, and providing accurate, unbiased health information. We were also, fun fact, founded in 1975, almost 50 years ago. We understand that to remain true to our progressive and feminist roots, we must continually evaluate and update what we do and how we do it as the world changes around us. Part of charting this path forward means expanding access to health information in creative ways on platforms where real people are actually gathering. What you are about to hear is one of our new ways forward, the network's live recording of Your Health Unlocks first episode. This recording was produced at our fall fundraising event on October 27th, our first in-person event held in over two years. I had the privilege of speaking with three panelists about the history, present, and future of the women's health movement. Their full bios are in the show notes, but to give you a sense of these absolute giants, our first panelist, Ms. Billy Avery, is a healthcare activist, past board member of the network, and founder of the Black Women's Health Imperative, the first national organization to specialize in Black women's reproductive health issues. A proponent of reproductive justice, Billy's work to develop healthcare services and education that address Black women's mental and physical health predates the network's founding. Our second panelist, Cynthia Gutierrez, is an award-winning, first-generation Nicaraguan Salvadorian reproductive justice organizer. She's also a full-spectrum doula, cultural strategist, and accomplished writer and public speaker. She is currently the program manager for the University of California, San Francisco Hub of Positive Reproductive and Sexual Health, also known as HIVE, and Team Lily programs. In all her spare time, Cynthia is a proud abortion storyteller with We Testify and serves on the boards for Access Reproductive Justice, the California Coalition for Reproductive Freedom, and Women's Voices for the Earth. And last but not least, Rachel Branneman is the founder and principal consultant of Talon Consulting, a national diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice firm, which provides nonprofits the tools they need to build capacity, fundraise, and dismantle systems of inequity. Rachel has 20 years of nonprofit experience and is currently the network's interim director of development. And now, without any more ado, I will stop talking and switch over to the live recording. So yeah, we are going to ask our first question of Billy Avery. So no one on this stage has been fighting for women's health access and equity longer than you. Um, how have you seen the women's health movement grow from the 1970s until now in terms of strategies, key issues, and the like? Thank you, Adele. I have to laugh because now, Usually I'm the oldest person in the room. <laughs> you know, usually say who are the old people. Well, I'm the old people. <laughs> you will get to be the old people if you're lucky. Um, but anyway, jokes aside, thank you so much. Um, it's always an honor to um, participate in doing anything with the National Women's Health Network. Um, there are many histories of the network and I know all of you are very tech savvy. You can go to Wikipedia and read all about the founders and the wonderful work these courageous women did at a time when it was really very scary to stand up and speak out um, to these powerful white men who were literally ramming everything down women's throats. And these women did outrageous acts and they were brave, and they were bold. And you need to know the things that they did because the one question I get from younger people, what all did y'all do? How did you do it? So therein lies our strategies. We don't need to repeat it. Please stand on their shoulders. What I'm going to do tonight is tell the story of the network from my perspective, um, the one I know best. I um. Uh, most of you know, my husband died in um, 1970 from a massive heart attack. And we were living in Gainesville, Florida. And um, a month or two after he died, uh, 
before he died, he told me I read this book. I think you would like it. You need to read it. And it was better for Jan to film a mystique. And I was like thrown away. Didn't know what to do with it. Um, I got hooked up with some white women who were doing consciousness raising and um, CR groups is what you were called at that time. And um, we heard that these two women were coming to town to teach us about our bodies. And so we, uh, me, Judy Levy and Margaret Parrish and Jill Ruman and several other of us went to meet Lorraine Rockman and Carol Downer. These women travel across the country on the Greyhound bus with a box marked toys in which they had plastic speculums. And they, um, we got to this place and they talked to us about how important it was for us to learn about our bodies, that we needed to know our bodies, that we need to know what we look like inside. And Carol told us the story of being at her OBGYN and he had just done a vaginal exam. And so she asked him, could she see what he was looking at? And he told her it wasn't none of her business. So he went out of the room and she stole his speculum and put it in her pocketbook. <laughs> and she went home and got out a flashlight in the mirror and a speculum looked at her cervix and the women's health movement was born. And that's how we all got started. Along came a group of women in Boston, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. They decided to organize this big conference at Harvard on women in health. And it was magnificent. There were women there from all over the United States and probably other parts of the world. And um, it didn't cost a penny to get to, to be at this meeting. And they talked about everything, all of the things that we were told we were not to talk about, that was on the table. That's what we talked about. That conference is still with me and was very inspirational in my host in the first national conference on Black women's health issues um, in 1983. We feel we're coming up on our 40th anniversary for that. But back to this story. So, um, the network set out, uh, uh, we founded, we opened up the Gainesville Women's Health Center, three women of us, and then we later opened up a birthing center. But while we were at the Gainesville Women's Health Center, Friday came from the network saying we could be a board member. And so Judith and Libby and I decided she was going to do the academic thing with the university. I was going to do the grassroots thing. So this sounded like a grassroots thing. So I became a board member, me and Pam Freeman and another woman named Joyce Williams. We were the three black women on the board. And then I met all of the other people, Melita Cowan, um, Judy Norsegian, Norma Smith. And these were like the stars. I was on the board with the stars of the women's health movement. And um, <clears throat> may I have some more? Yeah. And then... Um, at one point, we, um, I was in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I was, speak I was sitting next to Norma Swenson and um, uh, Nina Finkenstein. And you know, neither one of those names sound like that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got to, I was hit that, oh, maybe I'll do a program on Black women's health. Maybe I'll look at what's happening with us as Black women because I was quite concerned, thank you, Terry, that Black women were not showing up for the well woman part of the abortion clinic, but were getting the abortion. And the, and the white girls from the University of Florida, they were flooding in there, getting all that health information and everything, and the Black women weren't doing it. So I said to Norma and Nina, do you think this is a good idea? They said, we think it's a great idea. And the rest is history. Belita Cowan, who was the head of the network, took me under her wing, along with the other women at the network. I did not know Black women all over the country. I knew Black women in Gainesville in Florida. And when I started planning the conference, the women said to me, 
what can we do to help you? I said, do you know any black women where you are? And they said, yes. And I said, well, send them to me. And that's what they did. And we pulled the planning committee together. Belita at the network taught me everything. We, uh, I didn't know how to write a proposal. I'm a special ed teacher. I didn't know anything about writing proposals. We were all wearing jeans and, 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 uh, and little tarts. So I had to learn how to cook. <laughs> they dressed me up. We had a funders briefing. Belita took me around to foundations. She introduced me. She taught me how to do it. Taught me about program work. Taught me everything. I got nothing but 100% um, support from the National Women's Health Network. Without that support, I could have gotten disappointed. I could have given up. I, I, but I didn't. And they were with me. And some of these people still remain in my life and very good friends. And the conference that I went to in Boston, one of the very first things we did after we put together this planning committee um, uh, that worked for two years at Spelman Conference to plan this conference, one of the first things, um, I, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, oh, I remembered the conference from Boston. I remember how inclusive it was, how we talked about being a lesbian, how we talked about abortion, how we talked about all of the things that we, those were the two things the hardest thing, you know, to talk about, how we included all of that. 2,000 women came to Atlanta and we all went home empowered. And because of that now, we have a very, very strong network of Black women-led organizations working on Black women's health all over the country. That's awesome. You tell a heck of a story. <laughs> and I am so glad I live to see. Oh, we are too. Oh my God. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that, Billy. You know, a couple of things come up in your, you know, tale, the importance of being able to say the unsayable, right? right? Being able to have real conversations. And I mean, literally like, but you built the network, you built this network. So thank you for that. I mean, that's incredible, but that network was really important to you. So um, with that, I would like to move on to Cynthia Gutierrez. Um, we'll start with you for this next one. Um, what in your experience helps, you know, move women's health issues forward today? Because you're in the thick of it today, right? With Hive and Lily. And what advice do you have for other people out there in the movement who want to get things done? Um, good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to be here today. Um, again, my name is Cynthia Gutierrez. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. And I'm visiting you all from the Ohlone land in East Oakland, California. It's very important for me to acknowledge the indigenous land that I come from and I rock East Oakland till the end of time. Um, I say all that because um, one thing that I've learned in my time, and, and first of all, thank you so much for what you shared. Like I was listening to you, I could listen to you all night, all night, the day after, the next week after. And I was just so um, honored to share space with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, one thing that I think about often is for me, um, in my personal life, I grew up in an immigrant household. Um, my family migrated from Nicaragua in the late 1980s to San Francisco. And so when you come from a family in a community um, in a city that is just trying to survive, we weren't talking about women's health issues. Um, we weren't never talking about abortion. I grew up in a very Catholic household. Um, and so for the longest time, a lot of these topics were so taboo. They were nothing that ever got brought up. They were very silent. Um, and so um, it wasn't until I got into adulthood that I realized, oh, there are parts of me, uh, parts of these stories that connect us all. They're um, not issues that have stigma. Uh, everything from uh, birth to abortion and all the reproductive health choices in between. 
I will say for me that um, this January will be 10 years since I've had my abortion. And I am so happy that I had my abortion. I have no regrets about my abortion. And my abortion has provided me a life that I could have never dreamed about. And I say this so unapologetically because these are the stories that people in my community need to hear. They need to see a brown woman with indigenous features saying that my abortion saved my life. And that's a big part of my work with We Testify as an abortion storyteller. Um, 10 years ago, could I have said this? No, I had so much fear and internalized stigma and was in so much isolation and questioned uh, all the things that had happened to me and you know, questioned my faith, my God, my spirituality, but I'm in a point in my life where I'm so grateful for that decision. And so because I had that decision to have an abortion, now I can support others in having their abortions by being an abortion doula, um, by working in a hospital where we talk openly about abortion and provide those services. And one beautiful thing that storytelling has really led is not only has it given me a lot of personal freedom to live my truth and be unapologetic, but it's allowed other people to see themselves in my truth and share their stories. Um, I would say one of the proudest moments I've ever had in my life is having another first generation Central American. She's Afro Salvadorian. She came up to me. She was like, I had an abortion too. And she's like, you're the first person I've ever told. And I mean, if she's in a relationship, she's in a, you know, she's had her child now. It's, uh, she's had a very full life so far. But the fact that like, it took seeing someone like her to be like, I see myself in you is what really moved her. And so one of my many roles and many titles, I, I have, sometimes I forget them if it wasn't for the bio, but I will say one of the things that I'm so passionate about is like speaking our truth and being very clear that a lot of spaces are not safe to do that, especially a lot of spaces that are white powered and have white supremacy culture to them and quote unquote professionalism. Um, so being able to really build that courage, be able to build our tribe, our community to speak our truths, because now more than ever, we need to be able to say these things, um, especially since Roe has um, fallen. Um, so I would say storytelling is a big part of the cultural shift that I'm invested in and helping other young Black, Indigenous people of color share their stories. And sometimes it's just sharing it with one other person. And sometimes it's for folks maybe to write down their story for themselves and maybe never say it to somebody else. Other times it's helping another abortion story storyteller write their story and share it in front of a national audience. Like, the process looks different, but regardless, like we're still doing this in community and we're not siloed in these lived experiences anymore. Thank you so much. Storytelling is, is powerful, right? We live on stories. So thank you for sharing yours with us today. Um, we feel truly privileged. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to ask the same question of Rachel. What helps get things done in this space? What is it? Oh, well, thank you. And I'm really glad to see all of you this evening. And I'm just honored to be on stage with you all. Um, I, I would say that um, as a white woman who comes from a background of privilege, that one of the things that people who have um, unearned privilege and um, resources that not everybody else has is being able to uh, be an ally and also use civil dis disobedience and um, stand up on behalf of other folks. So that's one of the things that, especially the last few years, I have made sure to do more of. And, um, you know, a few years ago, there was a massive arrest here in DC where 600 women were arrested around in family se separation. And that was an opportunity for, I feel like women who uh, had not necessarily uh, been able to speak up um, and talk about some of the things that are affecting other groups that don't look like them. Um, to actually be on the front line. And while that is definitely a privileged arrest, but uh, being able to show that this is uh, the next step forward. And also, as Miss Billy was saying, it's something that um, the generations before us had done, and we, we can't lose sight of what has been done in the past and continue to use those same uh, actions 
in our current movements. Just to be clear, you were arrested, right? That's I, what, I was okay. arrested, yes. All right, props, props. Good for you. Like the <laughs> so direct actions were, you know, direct action. nonviolent direct action. That's, <laughs> that's what, uh, that's what moves the needle. Thank you for that. Um, okay. So my next question is going to go to all of you. We're going to go down the line, starting with Ms. Billy once again. Um, we just talked about some of the things that help this movement, right? Um, what actions or strategies do harm or act as barriers to moving the case of women's healthcare access and equity forward? Barriers? Mm -hmm. Some other than mean men. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's an obvious one. Long-headed people. Um, huh. Barriers. Everywhere I turn, there's a barrier. Let me let me let me um refine. Like what 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 are what are some things that maybe like well-intentioned activists do that don't help? Oh, speak for other people. Um, think that there's only one way to do things. I know one of the things I learned um, early on with the Black Women's Health Project, um, a woman was organizing in Detroit and this um, very well-meaning um, white woman called me up. She's on the network board. She said, well, she's doing it all wrong. You know what? And, you know, I think, you know, would you talk to her? So I said, well, I'm going to talk to her and see what she's doing. So I called her. What she was doing was fine. It was just different. You know, it was, you know, understand that there's power in difference. And, uh, and, and, and people need to be respected. I'll tell you one thing that I think happened that damaged our movement. And maybe because this is the way I uh, was taught to organize. We... We, we opened the abortion clinic. Four years later, we opened the birthing center. Whenever I speak, I talk about abortion and birth in the same center. They are a part of us, all of us, that happen. I don't see any need for this polarization, okay? I also think that because our movement did not uh, look at broadening. This is what we call it. I remember having a big argument with a uh, woman. I said, you need to broaden the definition of reproductive health to include infant mortality, maternal mortality. No, they said, we have to have our single issue abortion. And I knew that if they did it this other way, you would move people. You educate them in, 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 in uh, because we have babies and we have abortions. We're the same women. You know, and it makes common sense. We don't, we're not again. And they would not, that movement, the white women would not listen to us, the black women. They didn't listen. They didn't listen. They didn't listen until it got late. Then they were ready to turn it over to us. We forgot the justice came along. Black women in charge of this. Black women in charge of that. Well, damn thing, the ship was going down. <laughs> you know, they gave it to us when it was going down. And so not listening to everybody. Listen, because sometimes when you just shut up and listen a minute, you'll learn something and you'll get a different perspective. And that's one of the most damaging things now. Yes. <laughs> what she said. Thank you so much. All right, Cynthia, some other barriers. What do well intentioned? Thank you so much. The water was a detail that I neglected. I appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you so much. What other things harm when we want to help, right? What other things get in the way? So I totally agree with you around being able to talk about the full spectrum of reproductive health. And um, I work as a program manager in San Francisco for an OBGYN uh, at UCSF, the University of California, San Francisco. And one of the teams that I help manage is called Team Lily. And what's so special about this team is that we serve pregnant people who are experiencing the most extreme barriers to care. I'm talking about substance use disorder, homelessness, 
incarceration or previous incarceration, intimate partner violence, uh, poverty, all these barriers, all these social determinants at once. And if you can imagine all these barriers happening to you while you're pregnant, it's one of the most challenging things an individual can go through. Um, so one of the things that I found to be a barrier in that space is that funding. So whenever we want to get funding to expand our services, um, to expand it to the postpartum period. So right now we support people in prenatal care and folks come to us, I mean, as late as the third trimester, um, usually around the second trimester, let's say that they have birth, we can you know, help them with a handful of visits. And we have this really phenomenal wraparound team where they get the same OBGYN, the same social worker and a patient navigator throughout their entire care. The thing that's been so hard is that we don't have the funding to be able to support them beyond a couple of postpartum visits. So you're having these folks who, unless we're able to get them into a shelter, which if any of you know San Francisco, all of these shelters are completely maxed out. There's no extra beds right now, or we get them in some sort of residential treatment. Um, and that's if the person wants to do that. Now we have to, you know, then the conversation goes around consent and like forcing someone into treatment and, you know, giving them as much autonomy as possible, but also there's only so many places one can go. And so unless someone has these things in place or, you know, has another form of housing, temporary housing, they're immediately going back to the streets. And when I say the streets, folks are living in old abandoned cars or living in tents. Um, they're uh, living in shelters. And so these are the situations where our city of San Francisco does not have enough uh, shelter beds for these families. And often these shelters, one of the downfalls of them is that they might accept the pregnant person if, if they're still pregnant at the time, um, but they won't accept their partner. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was pregnant, I wasn't going to like go anywhere without having my significant other. That's a very lonely experience. Um, you know, some of these pregnant people have dogs. They don't allow dogs. They might not allow additional children with them. And so we're finding that in order for us to be able to continue doing our work and expanding beyond the first couple of weeks of the postpartum period, funding is a big part of it. Um, a lot of this funding is very siloed. You might have a funder that tells you, I will fund people who are experiencing homelessness, but not really interested in people who have been formerly incarcerated. And so they want to, they want people to, in a sense, take off their identities when you can't, you're this full person, you're having this lived experience. Another thing that I um, am an advocate for is having, um, providers, social workers, nurses, NICU nurses, a staff at the hospital to be more trauma-informed. You, you won't believe the number of times where we have conversations with staff and um, have to be really honest about, does this person need to be referred to CPS? And if, when I say CPS, Child Protective Services, or what I call it the family regulation system, if they are going to go through that process, are you doing this for the, the best situation for this family, for this baby? Or because quite frankly, you have a bias in your racist and you don't think that this family is equipped to take care of their child or children on their own because you have some implicit bias about them and you're just racist. You can imagine I'm not quite popular when I bring up these questions and I have to do it in a way that sometimes is a little bit more uh, tolerable for them. But um, I say this all because I would say funding these type of clinic programs is a huge barrier. Getting folks that are trained to be compassionate. I mean, you would think like compassion would be a very simple emotion to have, but I think um, it's, it's, it's often not when I work in, in this medical field and um, I think people sometimes get overwhelmed when they have a patient that has so many barriers. And instead of taking a deep breath and just recognizing those barriers and doing the best that they can to serve them, they often kind of make the situation worse. And then the patient feels like 
they don't want to interact with a certain person in a hospital or a certain care team member. And so um, I'm just a big advocate for how do we continue learning more about anti-oppression? How do we continue not being racist? Like, how do we continue learning about harm reduction? How do we have more education around substance use and all of these different things? Because we're having providers and care teams that don't have this lived experience, but they're going out treating people who do um, and might not be um, a good care team for them. So those are kind of some of the barriers on the hospital, prenatal, postpartum side. Yeah, no, that's that's incredibly enlightening. Thank you. And like what you're you're really getting at one of our core issues uh, here at the network, which is the social determinants of health, right? Um, you know, all of these complicating factors um, play into a person's experience of, you know, pre postnatal care and the hospital system. And if you don't address them, you don't address their health, right? So thank you for, for bringing that to such colorful light. That was awesome. Um, Rachel, what gets in the way? Well, I mean, I want to touch a little bit on what Cynthia was saying earlier around storytelling and how um, we allow politicians and philanthropists and other people to um, create the dominant narrative of what's out there. And, you know, we separate, uh, you know, reproductive health, as we're saying right now, into and kind of putting it into its tiny little box when, you know, issues like the uh, in family separation is put into a box of immigration, when in reality, family separation is very much about um, reproductive health and healthcare in general. And that's something that we have not, we are allowing, um, others to shape the stories rather than, um, putting the stories out there from the people who are on the ground, those lived experiences. And I think nonprofits in particular, um, are, are guilty of not necessarily, um, investing the resources. And, you know, you spoke to a little bit of how philanthropists don't want to fund all of this work. They say, well, I don't want to fund incarcerated people. Or I only want to fund this particular thing. And, um, with that power differential, we are kind of stuck in this, um, situation where, you know, we're telling philanthropists, okay, well, you have that power over us to tell us what we are able to do. And in reality, we need to take back that power and say, this is, um, our responsibility to like create the narrative and move this forward. And this is how we will be doing it. And you're welcome to join us in that movement, but it is not your responsibility to tell us how the movement goes. Cool. Oh, we got some Rachel in here. <laughs> Rachel's in the house. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, thank you so much for that. Um, you two should talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, and finally, because I think it's really important to end uh, on a hopeful note, I'm going to skip right to our last question. Um, which is, I'm going to go down the line. What is your single biggest accomplishment, the one you're most proud of in women's health, and what did you learn from it? Ms. Billy. Well, <laughs> I'm most proud of Black women. And I'm proud of the way Black women have embraced um, looking at our health issues and the perspective developed around them. It's not, you know, at first I thought it was just health education. You know, we teach them how to do this and da 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 da, da and everything will be okay. Then we thought, well, if we could just get people into service, you know, da 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 da, da. We ended up beating on uh, everybody about what you don't do and what you do. We're in a different place now. We're looking at the systems that oppress us and the way the systems are really, or how racism has become so institutionalized. And what I'm proud of is seeing Black women leading on the issue of looking at race-ism and how it affects all parts of our lives. And it not only affects Black people's lives, it affects white people's lives just as well. And, and being bold and brave enough to face up to it and calling it for what it is and speaking out and doing the work. That's one thing. And um, I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that, that deserves a clap, I think, for sure. <laughs>
Cynthia? Oh, this is such a good question. Can I mention two things really quickly? No. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I will say, because I really want to give them a shout out on this podcast, is my work with Black Millennials for Flint. They're an incredible organization doing national work around environmental justice. And um, they and I, we've collaborated a lot on like maternal health panels and teach-ins. And we're just, we have so many projects we've done and we're going to do in the next year. So be on the lookout for that. But I am so now. proud to be able to work with such incredible Black women and for them to like not only work with me on this intersection of reproductive justice and environmental justice, but for them to then be in sisterhood with me. These women threw me a virtual baby shower in the pandemic um, because I did not have one because of COVID-19. And I... You know, I'm a, I always tell them how much I love them because it, the one thing this movement has shown me is that we need to invest in the people in this movement. We need to love on each other and we need to show up for one another. Um, I would say the little second thing I was going to put is being able for myself to be vulnerable, to have younger folks come into this movement. Um, I identify as a millennial. So now these Gen Zers uh, are coming in and they're so smart and they're so incredible and they're so bold. And yeah. And it's like, right. I see some of these young folks and they have so much courage that I didn't have at their age. It took me, you know, a handful of years to, to be like right. them. And I'm proud that like, by me sharing my stories and me sharing what I've learned along the way, I make it easier for them to feel included with their whole identities in the reproductive justice movement. Um, because I know it's not mine to keep. I'm not here to like keep the seat warm for myself forever. Um, the seat is meant for all of us. And um, to be able to just be a vessel for young black and indigenous you know, women of color to come through, that's the biggest blessing that I've had. Thank you. You heard it here, folks. First, folks, it's not the Iron Throne. It's the opposite of the Iron Throne. Rachel, what are you most proud of? Um, well, I think uh, one of the things that I um, am really able to do well is especially working um, as a consultant in the nonprofit space is I primarily work with Black and Brown-led organizations, and they are the ones who are receiving the least amount of philanthropic funding, but they are the ones who are doing the most um, amount of work on the ground directly with people. So making sure that they have access to the resources they need, making sure that they have um, the connections they need in order to, um, you know, have uh, philanthropists who might not otherwise know about the work that they're doing. So um, getting their foot in the door with, you know, grant writing and things like that, which are, you know, just some of these things that come fairly naturally to white led institutions that um, are just not necessarily as easily accessible. So helping them overcome these barriers that they're facing. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do for all of us. Billy would like to say one last thing. Absolutely. I would be remiss if I didn't say um, we're so proud that this year the Black Women's Health Imperative turns 40. That's right. The Black Women's Organization alive for 40 years has not been easy. Uh, but now we have an incredible, wonderful ED in Linda Goldberg Blunt. And she came to us with the vision. We got in line. The captain was on the ship. We turned that ship around. She's now been with us almost 10 years. And we are nothing like the tiny little organization we were in. We are big. We are bold. We are out there. We are dealing with the big people. I mean, and, and going into the one program we have, I'm just going to talk just a second, is Fair Work. And we, um, uh, I think so far, they've interviewed 4,000 Black women who work with some of the largest corporations in the U.S. about how they're being treated. And by the end of next year, they will get 6,000 more. So they'll have a whole cohort of 10,000 Black women 
that they're working, who work at Google, who work all these big places, y'all name them, Target, all of them. Those are the, that's the damn Target working on. And so I'm just, I'm just so proud. It's not the organization it was in 1983. And it's certainly not the one it was in 90. <laughs> but it is the one that it is now in 2020. Rache. Thank you so much, Philly. Yay. Happy Black and Health Imperative. All right, everybody, you are released from service. <laughs> Thank you again. Big round of applause. One more for all of our panelists. Are you ready to take control of your career, your schedule, and your income? Get the skills and insight to start your own thriving freelance business via the free video training at www.freefreelancetraining.com. Make this the year that you finally put your goals first. www.freefreelancetraining.com. Sponsored by Nikki K Media.